Seasons, greetings, magical souls. If you're on the hunt for a festive reed sprinkled with holiday magic, you've come to the right place. Welcome back to my channel, your haven for all things witchy. Today, we're unwrapping the holiday magic with A Curse for Christmas, a special novella from the Trouble Down Under series by P.A. Mason. So grab a cup of your favorite winter brew, snuggle up in your coziest blanket, and let the Yuletide enchantment unfold. This holiday special promises a blend of mystery, merriment, and maybe even a touch of chaos. Before we dive into the festive spellbinding, make sure to hit that subscribe button, give this video a thumbs up, and share your favorite holiday reads in the comments below. I can't wait to hear about your go-to magical tales. Let's unwrap the magic of A Curse for Christmas. Stay tuned and let the holiday reading festivities commence. Chapter 1 I must have forgotten what traveling for 24 hours between Australia and Arkansas was like. Otherwise, the idea of a quick trip home for Christmas wouldn't have seemed in any way sensible or even pleasant. International travel must involve the same kind of mind trickery they talk about with forgetting the pain of childbirth. Having my cousin's new fiancé, Jake, pick me up from the airport was at least some small concession. If I'd had to pick up a rental car, I was sure I would have left it parked on the side of the road and crawled in the back in a post-flight stupor. His big, shiny truck looked freshly washed, despite the fact he'd driven all the way from Texas, and he got out to stow my luggage in the back with a grin. Great to see you, Cat. He gave me a brief hug and opened the passenger door. I'd forgotten how tall the guy was. You look beat. Smothering a yawn, I nodded and climbed in. Living halfway across the world from grandma has its perks, but the trip home leaves a lot to be desired. The on-flight coffee just adds insult to injury. Jake chuckled at that and rubbed his hands together as he got in the driver's seat. The shock that had come from leaving one place in summer and arriving in another in winter had me piling on extra clothes before I even left the terminal. The heating in the truck was cranked up, though, and with my hands tucked into my armpits, I thawed out as Jake pulled out toward the highway. Driving, huh? Did Marissa fly ahead of you? I asked. Marissa's been home for a few weeks. The mention of her name conjured a goofy grin on his face. She's getting the last of her stuff together so we can drive it back together before New Year's. A pang in my stomach reminded me I hadn't properly caught up with my cousin for a while. We were both busy. Theirs was a whirlwind romance, and I shouldn't have been surprised she was already moving across state lines to start her new life. Wow, and how are the wedding plans coming along? Jake shrugged, but the twinkle in his eye spoiled the feigned boredom on his face. I don't ask. I'll just turn up on the day and make sure my boots are clean. I snickered and peered down at a pair of proper cowboy boots on the pedals. If she lets you wear them, ain't nothing wrong with them. He tucked an errant blonde lock behind an ear and tapped the steering wheel. And if we're getting hitched in Texas, the wedding planner will be on my side. I snorted and rolled my eyes, but the talk of weddings brought me back to the curiosity, which may have been the reason I was looking forward to the international flight. Mom's new boyfriend. Talking of couples, have you met this new beau of mom's? I said, new, but really, mom didn't date. Like, ever. I'd almost fallen off my seat when she'd sheepishly told me over the phone to expect a plus one at Christmas. Jerome, yeah. Jake nodded and glanced at me before returning his eyes to the road. Seems harmless enough for a werewolf, I guess. Your mom looks happy. I bit my lip as Jake shifted in his seat. He was going to have to get more comfortable with the magic in the family. His mother was a witch, but a recluse from the magical community as far as I knew and Jake took after his father in the magic department. That is to say, he was as regular as they came. You don't have wares back in Texas? I quirked an eyebrow. Though in fairness, Jake probably wouldn't have much cause to be aware of them. Probably, but I don't know, Kat, maybe it's impolite, but my mom, he puffed out his cheeks. Well, she said it ain't right, I don't know what to make of that. I took a deep breath. I'd been waiting for this, but maybe not from Jake. It's not regular, that's for sure. Wares and witches typically don't, uh, fraternize. 
There's a pretty big clan of wares and tumbling springs, but they mostly keep to themselves and live out on bigger properties. Kind of like communes. Did you catch his last name? Jake frowned and shook his head. Only met the guy once, and only for a minute. But I don't think he's a local from what Marissa said. Huh. I stared out the window as the conversation fell into a lull, tucking that tidbit of information away. If there was a new wolf in town, it was sure to ruffle the feathers of both the witches and the wares in the mostly magical community of Tumbling Springs. I hoped Mom wasn't getting too much guff over it all. And if Jake said she was happy, well, then I was happy too. She deserved it. The seat goes right back if you want to take a nap. Jake jerked his thumb toward the electric dials nestled down beside me. We've got a few hours ahead of us. I played around with the buttons and was pleasantly surprised to find the leather seat reclined even further than the cramped seats on the plane. I groaned with appreciation and shifted to get more comfortable. Almost as good as a bed. Just wake me before we get into tumbling springs, won't ya? I need to stop into cherries and pick up a possum pie. Possum pie? Roadkill a Christmas tradition for you folks? Jake teased. Ha! Huh, you ain't lived until you've had a possum pie from cherries. We actually know what to do with pecans in Arkansas. Jake chuckled. Them's fighting words. I grinned and made a mental note to tell Marissa she should serve possum pie at the wedding reception. Living in Australia might have come with its own interesting culinary experiences, but I was pining for the familiar taste of home. Perhaps I should have packed a few more pairs of elasticized pants. With droopy eyelids, I let sleep weigh me down. The gray clouds overhead had turned to rain, and the sound of it pelting on the windshield accompanied the droning sound of tires on the road. I was definitely going to need some beauty sleep before arriving back at the Crow Ancestral home. Christmas was a serious business for witches. I got the impression I'd been snoring when I woke to Jake clearing his throat loud enough to startle me. I sat up in my seat, madly blinking, and heaved a deep breath. It was still raining, but through the blurry windshield, I still made out the faded red sign marked cherries. An unbidden smirk twisted my lips at the welling nostalgia, and I rubbed my grainy eyes before unbuckling my seatbelt. Well, I must have been beat. Feel like I was out cold. Didn't think I was gonna wake ya. You're not selling me on this honeymoon to Australia idea Marissa's got going on. What's wrong with a little jet lag between lovers? I grinned as I hopped out of the truck, but the icy air had me crossing my arms and hunching over to jog to the bakery's door. Jake followed me in, but made a beeline for the hallway to the side, which led to the bathrooms. The familiar scent of baked goods filled my nostrils, and despite the sudden shiver from the cold outdoors, I felt warmed in my very soul. Katerina Crow! Cherry, the grandmotherly proprietor, called out. A smudge of what looked like flour marred her beaming, deeply lined face. What a treat to see you here. Your grandma said you was living in Tabitha's old house in Australia, was it? Sure am, I sidled up to the counter. But I wouldn't miss Christmas for the world. You keeping well? Fine as a frog's hair, though the season has me run off my feet. What can I get ya? Possum pie, of course. I've been hankering for a slice ever since booking my flight home. But don't go telling mom that. I snickered, but even mom would understand. As a witch with a particular flair for culinary delights, Cherry's wares left home baking for dead, and arriving home with a pie would put me in good stead with the family. Cherry smiled benevolently, but her face dropped some as the bell over the door tinkered behind me. I turned, then wondered what Blanche Baker had done to upset the woman. But Blanche's eyes were all for me, and she fixed me with a frosty stare. Blanche, I nodded with a polite smile. Good to see ya. Blanche was a studious gardener, a little too rigid in my opinion. But it was hex magic she was known for among the magical community. She wasn't highly regarded as grandma, perhaps, but that could come down to Blanche having less political ambition. Grandma was the only witch in Arkansas with a seat on the Arcane Council. Home, are ya? She looked me up and down. Suppose your mother couldn't wait to introduce you to her new dog? My mouth hung open at the insult. 
Sure, I'd expected there'd be whispers around tumbling springs, but if Blanche was directing her ire at me, well, things were a lot worse than I thought. I didn't recall Blanche having any particular prejudice against the local werewolves, and I was about to tell the woman just that when Cherry stepped in for me. Blanche, you quit being ugly to this girl, who Sharon's courtin' is none of her business. Jake chose that particular moment to arrive back from the restroom, though he paused at the sight of us like he'd happened upon a pair of hissing cats. I glanced at him and swallowed, trying to decide if possum pie was worth it after all. Cat, you take this pie and head on home. Cherry rounded the counter with a bagged pie in hand. On the house. Sure. Blanche rolled her eyes. You be sure to keep the crows in your back pocket, but I wouldn't bet on Sybil getting another term on the council after this. You're backing a losing horse, Cherry. You know, Blanche, after growing up in Tumbling Springs, I know how many people think you're a rotten apple, but I always thought that was unkind. I took the pie and fixed Blanche with a level stare. Until today, that is. Thank you, Cherry. I'll be sure to pass my regards onto Mom and Grandma. Jake held the door for me as I scooted out, and I paused in the doorway long enough to share a look with Cherry. I wasn't worried about her coming off second best in a war of words with Blanche, but I felt like running out was impolite. Her lips quirked just a little, which let me know she caught my meaning, so I gave a little wave before trotting back to the truck. What was that about? Jake asked as he got in. Seems like your mom isn't the only one with ill feelings about this new romance, I sighed. Let's not mention it when we get home, huh? No need to spoil Christmas on account of a crabby old lady. Nobody'll hear it from me. Jake fired up the engine and pulled out onto the street. But I still say a good Texan pecan pie looks better than that vermin pie of yours. I narrowed my eyes at him theatrically. You just wait, mister. You'll be eating those words soon enough. Chapter Two When we pulled up the long, puddle-strewn driveway to the Crow Ancestral home, I took a moment to drink in the sight of the timber-sided house I was always so keen to leave behind in my quest to move out of town. It was beautiful, in a rundown kind of way. And though Mom and Grandma weren't the home improvement types, it was clear the ancestors who built the house back in the 1800s set out to make it grand. The creeping vines on the south side of the house were looking treacherous again, but I could take care of that while I was home. As for the rest, I supposed it was going to be up to Marissa to get the place back up to snuff eventually. But then, maybe not, if she moved to Texas. I risked a glance to the gardens beside the house, always a nasty, overgrown surprise whenever I'd been away for too long, but I couldn't tell if it was any worse than the last time I'd been back. My quiet observations were cut short when Marissa came squawking out of the house with both arms flung out. I expected her to leap into Jake's arms, but instead she tore past him to heave the passenger door open and all but crushed me in a hug. Good to see you too, cuz. I squeezed my eyes shut at the rain, which was now slanting in through the door. How about we do the obligatory squealing inside, huh? Marissa snorted but gave way as I unbuckled and jumped out of the truck. Jake was already hauling suitcases toward the porch, but I stopped to grab a duffel bag out of the back and held it over my head as I jogged up the sagging timber steps. Are those sandals? Marissa scoffed. It was summer when I left, I protested. And is it just me or is it freezing? Nope, it's colder than a brass brassiere. Folks are saying it might snow. I frowned at that but hustled inside. Snow wasn't a Christmas tradition in Arkansas, even if we lived up in the mountains. I was about to say something to that effect when my eyes snagged on the kitchen doorway. Mom was pouring tea with a small smile, and behind her, and I mean right behind her, a tall man with a liberally gray-streaked beard whispered something in her ear. Wow, I couldn't quite seem to look away. A boyfriend was something, the sight of my mother cozying up to a man was something else. When she looked up, my cheeks burned, and I clicked my teeth shut with a sheepish smile. Well, here she is, Mom beamed and took Jerome's hand to lead him into the entryway. Thought you two must have gotten turned around or something. I raised my eyebrows. 
like I'd ever get lost coming home, but grinned as mom held her arms out for a hug and embraced her. Springy brown curls scented with her favored bergamot shampoo tickled my nose, but beyond her wild hair, Jerome leaned against the kitchen door frame with a shy smile. Mom released me and held me at arm's length to look me up and down, but when she caught me looking over her shoulder, she bit her lip and ushered the man over. Cat, this is Jerome Jensen. Jerome, well, this is the daughter of mine I keep yammering about. Pleased to meet you, Jerome offered his hand. For a, let's call him an older gray wolf and not a silver fox, Jerome Jensen appeared, very superficially, to be quite a catch, which was a pretty icky thing to admit, given he was dating my mom. His closely cropped beard gave him a very lumberjack look, and broad shoulders on his tall frame gave off an outdoorsy vibe. I took his hand with a smile and murmured a greeting. But the introductions were cut short when Grandma's voice sounded in the living room, automatically making me wince. Katerina Crow, are you gonna make me sit here all day waiting on ya? As Grandma was the matriarch of the family, I shrugged a little apologetically at both Mom and Jerome and scooted into the living room before she could holler again. Grandma, I smiled. She sat on her usual wingback armchair, her feet propped up toward the fire. She didn't look any different than usual, iron gray hair swept back into a bun and her wizened face a perpetual scowl. I've missed you. I stopped short of giving her a hug and instead sat on the ottoman beside her feet. Grandma wasn't the overly affectionate type, but she showed she cared in her own way, in fleeting moments between grouching. But I'd still missed the woman. Well, you live in that backwater of a place, and you missed the Yule Vigil. Tabitha always made sure she was back no later than the 20th. I stood to unbuckle my silver wristwatch and glanced at the sideboard which served as the Yule altar each year. My great aunt Tabitha usually stayed for a good few weeks each year before her death, but juggling a new business in Australia meant I closed up the landscape supply yard in the afternoon and was on a plane by the early hours of the morning the following day. My employee, Bill, was still working solely to clear out the batch of freshly cut fir trees which served the township of Myrtle Glen for Christmas. I carried the watch to the sideboard and nestled the offering in among the other family trinkets, candles, and evergreen wreaths. Next year, I sighed. I promise. Getting a new business up and running has me super busy. I might be in a position to have more staff this time next year. I'm sorry I missed it, though. We're gonna need all the blessings we can get this year. It's darn cold out there, and there's something... Grandma shifted in her seat and frowned. Well, I'm not sure what, but I feel like the omens aren't with us this year. I wasn't sure I ever recalled a time where Grandma thought the omens were with us, but there was something about the tremor in her voice which sent a shiver up my spine. With her sister, my great aunt Tabitha, having died of cancer earlier in the year, I wondered if grandma had contemplated her own mortality. She was hale for a woman pushing 80, but I'd thought that about Aunt Tabby too. I'll keep vigil tonight, I promised. I napped all the way from the airport. I will too, grandma grunted as she stood, not like I sleep much these days anyhow. Can I smell something burning? My nose twitched, and I frowned toward the kitchen. On the eve of Christmas Eve, the kitchen was normally a hive of baking-related activity, and it smelled like something was amiss. I followed Grandma out to the hall and peered through the doorway where Mom was swatting at the smoking oven with a dishcloth. What have you gone and burned now, Sharon? Grandma barked, though her eyes crinkled in amusement. I'ma have to insist Jerome stays out of that kitchen with you if this keeps up. Grandma chuckled. Actually, chuckled. I looked between the kitchen where Mom was dropping a blackened pie crust into the sink while rolling her eyes and Grandma's amused appraisal of the situation. It was just... weird. While I figured that Jerome being in the house meant Grandma couldn't be that opposed to the match, her being playful threw me off guard. My fault, Sybil. Jerome came into view in the doorway and held his hands up in supplication. And of course, I'll take care not to interfere with kitchen matters. Can't ruin a sweet potato pie at Christmas. His accent didn't seem local, and my best guess from his lilting tone was that he might have been from Tennessee. But the mention of pie brought me back to the matter at hand, 
and I clicked my fingers, then clapped my hands. You know what? Scratch the sweet potato. I stopped past Cherry's on the way for a possum pie. Must have left it in the truck. Mom called out something that sounded appreciative, and I left Grandma in the entryway to retrieve the pie. Outside, the rain had relented, and from the porch I saw Mom's barn clearly as I fetched the bagged pie out of Jake's truck. My eyes lingered just a little longer than they would normally, and frowning, I tried to figure out what was out of place. There wasn't a single sound of grunting, bleeding, quacking, or any other kind of critter's call. Curious, I jumped puddles over the driveway, made a beeline for the side door, and hoped there hadn't been some mass escape from Mom's clinic. The barn served both animal and human alike, and as a renowned magical healer, she usually had a full house most weeks. But when I opened the door, all I could spot was a cow chewing some hay and a flashy-looking horse who nodded its head in a doze. That was it. I'd never seen the barn so quiet before. Leaving the beasts behind, I hastened my step back into the house. Rain or not, the air was mighty frigid, and I was still wearing sandals. Inside, Jake and Marissa sat snuggled on the couch together, with Marissa scrolling through her phone while chatting and pointing here and there to get Jake's attention. Wedding planning, no doubt. When she looked up, I shrugged and held up the pie, then kept moving to the back of the house where the kitchen was smelling a little less acrid. Mom and Grandma sat at the table, but Jerome was absent. I slid the pie onto the counter and pulled a mug down from an overhead cabinet. Possum pie, Mom sighed. I haven't been to Cherry's in a while. On the house, too. Cherry sends her regards. I chewed my lip as I rifled through the cupboards for coffee, not wanting to dwell on my visit at the bakery. That barn seems near on empty, though. Don't tell me you're running out of patience. Grandma grunted, and I turned with a quirked eyebrow. The mulish glare I was so familiar with had returned to her features, and the guarded look on Mom's face told me there was something wrong. It's that Peggy Gordon woman over in Darley, Grandma growled. Blows in six months ago and sets up shop like she thinks she has every right to be in these parts. From what I can piece together, her kin are all in Virginia. Why she decided to move to Darley of all places has me kerflummoxed. A magical healer? I leaned against the counter and turned on the coffee machine. Well, whatever passes for one in Virginia. Mom took a sip of tea and sighed. But that's petty. We don't have the right to be dictating who gets to move into town. Things are fine, Cat. Just a little competition is all. Competition? Grandma snorted. That woman is undercutting something fierce and doing a sloppy job to boot. That botched job on Allison's niece? I reckon that arm won't ever knit together quite right despite your best efforts. That makes it our business. I've a mind to talk to the council about setting up some proper credentials once and for all. Mom looked close to rolling her eyes, but took a deep breath and turned her attention to me. Enough about me. How's this garden shop going? Less garden and more landscaping. I was happy to let Mom change the subject if it was making her feel uncomfortable. I could plot with Grandma later. Though I'm working on it, the yard is big enough to do both. It's just a matter of having enough time to get things set up properly. But business is steady, so no complaints there. And Gus as well? Mom stood to poke what smelled like a stew in a big pot on the stove. My ginger feline familiar had come to terms with living in Australia, though I thought he would almost be glad to be sent into kitty quarantine if it meant coming home. He's fine, still a great big grouch. I was thinking of getting him a kitten. Grandma snorted at the joke. Gus would most certainly take offense to a fluffy rival for attention, even one that couldn't speak telepathically. Well, I reckon this is just about done. Mom peered into the pot and waved a wooden spoon in my direction. Cat, go fetch Jerome from out back and rummage up some bowls, would ya? I glanced out the window, a little surprised, and went to check my wristwatch, which was now sitting on the Yule altar. It seemed a little darker out, but not by much, given the persistent gray clouds. But that was travel for you. As I stood, I wondered if I could sneak in a second nap after dinner ahead of the long night of vigil ahead of me. If not, there was always possum pie.
Chapter 3 After the briefest of post-pie naps on the couch in front of the fire, I woke to the sound of Grandma clearing her throat pointedly. That's about the strangest vigil I ever saw. I scooted up on the couch as she loomed over me, both fists planted on her narrow hips. Has everyone gone to bed? Yep, Sharon looked tired. Worry, no doubt. Grandma turned to the fireside and poked a bright red log. And Jake took Marissa over to Henry's for the night. They'll be back in the morning. I was looking forward to seeing Uncle Henry and Aunt Maxine, but it was the first of Grandma's remarks which caught my attention. So, this new healer woman is really causing trouble? Your mother has been the only healer for miles in over 20 years. Grandma plonked herself down in her armchair. And it's not like she charges accordingly for it. She says it's not a problem to see some of her oldest customers ditch her in favor of this charlatan, but it's plain that it stings. Of course it does. And when things go wrong and it's up to her to fix it, well, if it weren't for Jerome, I reckon she would have burst a blood vessel by now. And there it was again, the crinkle of amusement around Grandma's eyes. At dinner, Jerome had been just as cordial as he'd appeared earlier, and it seemed like he had the same sort of Midas touch with Grandma as my cousin Marissa. And though he said little, it was clear he was really settling into the family. Well, quality will win out eventually, I reasoned, and maybe it comes at a time when Mom could use a break anyhow. Tell me more about this Jerome, though. I never expected Mom to start dating, let alone with a... Wolf? Grandma gave me a sharp look. Don't you be judging. I'm not, I held up both hands. But from my visit to Cherry's, it seems like half the folks in Tumbling Springs are. I'm just curious about the guy. Grandma's jaw tightened. Who was it? I bit my lip, annoyed that I'd blurted the Cherry's part out. Blanche Baker, but Cherry put her back in her place. Darn it. Grandma thumped her fist on the armrest. I'm gonna have to pay that woman a visit. I thought I had things under control, but if she's flapping her gums, then it's worse than I expected. Is it just the witches? I cocked my head and stood to stretch my back. Or are there whispers among the wolves, too? Grandma sighed and shook her head. Who knows what the wolves are thinking? But Jerome isn't any of their kin. He's more a lone wolf type. There was talk a few weeks ago among some of the older heads in town. When I busted in on one of their little gossip sessions at the diner, I thought we put the matter to bed, but apparently not. Now, I was definitely regretting spilling the beans. We did not need a grandma kind of brouhaha on Christmas Eve in Tumbling Springs. Well, if they're all too scared to say anything to you, I'm sure in time it'll blow over. A lone wolf, though? Is that a thing with wares? I guess, Grandma said. She still looked madder than a wet hen, so I poured a couple of glasses of whiskey from the sideboard by the altar and handed her a tumbler. Though I reckon he might have left a pack over some kind of disagreement. He's not an alpha type, but maybe he took issue with the pack politics or some such. All I know is that he's handy with a chainsaw and puts a smile on your mother's face. The rest will come out in the wash. Chainsaw? I made a face. I hope you mean he's a logger or something. Arborist, Grandma corrected. Not much call for it out here with folks chopping their own wood, but he's called out across the state regularly, though I still find the notion of a wolf climbing trees funny. Outdoorsy, indeed. So no kids or family or anything? Just shows up on the doorstep like some fairy tale dream come true? I hated to sound so negative, but after my own jaded relationship history, Jerome's mystique was more on the concerning side, especially if he had a truck full of chainsaws. Katerina Crow, anyone ever tell you to mind your business? Just be happy for her, won't ya? If we're gonna be up all night keeping vigil, I don't want to hear you griping. My mouth hung open, but I clicked my teeth shut and took a sip of whiskey. I probably deserved it. People close to the family said the reason Grandma and I butted heads so often was that we were alike. Some days I found it hard to picture the similarities, but in a world gone mad where Grandma was telling me to mind my business, Perhaps there was a grain of truth in it. You want me to head out to light a fire? I grimaced at the darkness outside the window. It paid to be prepared to keep a vigil outdoors and have a fire burning hot before the sun went down. And it wasn't usually this cold. 
Grandma shook her head. We kept an outdoor vigil a few nights ago. My bones can't take the chill like they used to. No, let's stay inside and be prepared to meet the sun when dawn arrives. I sank back onto the couch, glad but a little bummed out at the same time. The outdoor vigil was one of those witchy traditions that I didn't expect to miss so much. Greeting the sun after the longest night of the year sounds like a powerful ritual, but really it was cold, wet, and boring as heck. Growing up, Grandma would be out every night for the entire week. I supposed if she was prepared to let me sit inside in front of a fire all night, the least I could do was keep the conversation pleasant. I mean, I would if she did. Greeting the sun took place outside by the gardens, and by then I was too beat to really care about the mess of plants, which had either grown into nasty tangles or shriveled back to nothing at the frost on the ground. I could get to it later. Once the sun had cleared the horizon, I turned on my heel with a mind to crawling into bed for a couple of hours while Grandma muttered something about a hot cup of coffee. But just as I was kicking off the pair of battered old boots I'd deemed too far gone to lug to Australia, headlights shined through the stained glass by the door. Looking over my shoulder, I noted Jake's truck in the driveway and Marissa already climbing out with what looked like a bag of groceries in her arms. You're late, I said flatly as she climbed the stairs to the porch. Sun's up already. Marissa gave me a long, suffering look, and even though I must have looked like death warmed up, she already had makeup on, and her hair looked styled even in a messy braid. Thought you'd appreciate some breakfast. Jake's never had biscuits and chocolate gravy before. The nap I'd planned on taking suddenly sounded less appealing. My stomach backed up the sentiment with a growl. I knew I should have packed more elasticized pants. Better you than me. Marissa patted her flat stomach. I've got a wedding dress to get into. I followed Marissa into the kitchen with a promise to Grandma to get some coffee brewed. As I pulled down the mugs from the cupboards, I fixed Marissa with a mock severe stare. Are you saying that I can eat what I want on account of being the spinster of the family? You can eat what you want on account of that gardening habit of yours. You eat like a horse, and nobody would ever guess. Whether that ever bags you a husband remains to be seen. Maybe I need to find myself a gardener. I pulled up a stool at the counter and watched Jake trail into the living room, rubbing a hand over his face. The crack of dawn didn't become the man. Or at least a guy who could build me some garden beds. Marissa raised an eyebrow. Got anyone in mind? That was a little too close to hunky landscaper Travis Larkin's territory for me, so I changed the subject and offered my services in preparation of what was a very Arkansas breakfast at Christmas time. Before long, I was completely lost in a conversation about venues, catering, flowers, and the price of an average wedding cake while rubbing butter into flour. It pleased me that Marissa seemed happy, though, and that her move to Texas to be with her man seemed a little more thought out than I'd expected. Jake says I can go in and do some work on reception with the company, but I've already reached out to one of Grandma's contacts in Dallas. I've never really made a big shot of it, but if I can apprentice myself to an established potions witch, then I figure technology can take care of the rest. Then by the time kids come around, I can work from home on the witchy web. Marissa had teased me for years, saying we should run a potions shop together, with my botanical magic skills keeping her supply cupboards full. It was something I was sure we both thought would never happen, and I was a little surprised she was getting serious about the craft again. Witchy Web is a game changer, that's for sure. You still brewing for mom? Yeah, when she asks. But that's never really been enough to make a career out of. I can still get things shipped here once I move. Marissa smiled. Potions were never really something I thought would ever work out. I mean, it's a small market, right? But this Davina I'm in touch with is pretty well known, so if I can get her endorsement, I should be cooking with gas. Good for you. They ready to go in the oven yet? I took a gulp of coffee and frowned at the dough Marissa kneaded on the floury counter. Sure are. Fetch me that pan, will ya? After Marissa got the biscuits baking, she turned her attention to the chocolate gravy, and while she seemed to only pay it half a mind, I was sure it would taste way better than anything I could have whipped up. Potions may have been her forte, 
but I thought if she'd ever taken interest, she could have had a place by Cherry's side as a baker's apprentice. I figured the notion was always less riveting to her than serving drinks and living a party lifestyle. Until now, that was. So I said I'd put the flower arrangements on hold and check out whether I could get a better deal with... I blinked heavy eyelids and followed Marissa's gaze to the doorway and the reason her detailed account of bridal flowers had been cut short. Mom stood hunched in her favorite deep purple velour dressing robe, her face a ghastly shade of white. Mom! I slid off the stool, immediately alert and rushed by her side. You okay? Mom straightened but held the doorframe like she might fall if she let go. Just a dizzy spell. Is that coffee brewing? I could use some. Ah, uh, sure. I hesitated for a second to be sure she could stand up straight and poured a mug from the percolator. Why don't we get you sitting down? Mom took the mug and took a small sip before shaking her head. I think I might go lie back down. A quick trance should set me right. I wasn't sure if I should let her climb the stairs by herself, but she waved me away in irritation when I went to follow her. Her springy brown curls seemed flat, and I watched her slowly climb the staircase with my stomach in knots. After listening for the sound of her bedroom door closing, I turned to Marissa, whose concerned expression must have matched mine. She'd had the presence of mind to take the chocolate gravy off the stove, but beyond that, she looked just as confused as I was. Mom was a magical healer. She was never, ever sick. Chapter Four The chocolate gravy-soaked biscuits didn't taste as good as they should have after that. It didn't stop Jake from going for a second helping, though. I was considering whether I should go for a doze or hold out just a little longer to see if Mom reappeared when Grandma fixed me with a mulish stare. She's fine. Now why don't you quit that sulking and get some rest? If you want to be helpful, you should get ready to take on some cooking this afternoon. If Sharon really is under the weather, we could use the help. Grandma hadn't seen Mom downstairs, so she'd only snorted when Marissa and I had shared our concern. But the more I thought about it, the more I worried. I just kept recalling the haggard bags under Mom's eyes. Jake shot me a sympathetic look while Grandma wasn't looking. It seemed the guy knew which side his bread was buttered on already. And I decided sitting at the kitchen table would not solve any problems. After the vigil, I didn't feel bad about leaving Marissa with the dishes, but just as I was yawning and pushing my chair back, I heard the squeal of the screen door beyond the kitchen and looked over my shoulder in surprise. Jerome filled the doorway to the laundry, and I frowned as I considered him scraping his boots. I hadn't heard the man get up or move around the house all morning, which meant he must have been out before dawn. Maybe it was a wolf thing. Morning, I called out. He looked up and gave me a chagrined smile. Hey, thought you ladies might have hit the hay by now. Vigils are hungry work. Marissa gathered empty plates and took them to the counter. And there ain't nothing better than biscuits and chocolate gravy to reward oneself. Can I get you any? Thanks, but no. Jerome patted his stomach. Maybe a little later, I was headed for a shower. Suit yourself. Marissa shrugged. Grandma prodded me underneath the table with her boot. Come on, you. It's to bed for both of us. So she could complain about not being able to sleep with so many people in the house, I griped internally. Her eternal struggle for sleep had foiled many a teenage plan of mine growing up. But the talk of bed had me yawning. So I nodded and took my mug to the sink as Grandma shuffled toward the stairs. I muttered an apology over the dishes to Marissa, who was having none of it, and she tugged at my sleeve before I could make my exit. Check on your mom, would ya? Her mouth twisted in a smirk. While the coast is clear with Jerome in the bathroom. The look on her face sent an involuntary shudder down my spine. I was going to have to learn to be much more grown up about all this mom dating stuff. But she had a point, so I nodded an affirmative and trudged upstairs. The second floor of the house had five bedrooms all up, with grandma's located furthest down the hall across from mine, and mom's being on the opposite end, where her window had a good view of the barn. I heard the muted sound of the shower running in the bathroom beside the stairwell, 
so I padded down the hallway and stuck my head into Mom's boudoir. At first glance, she appeared to be sleeping peacefully, and I almost turned to do the same, but there was something about the way the first rays of sunlight caught her features that gave me pause. She looked pale, deathly so, and I bounded to her bedside, reaching out to touch her cheek. She murmured something incomprehensible, and the clammy feeling under my fingertips told me that something was very wrong. Grandma, I screeched. Despite the noise, Mom's eyelids remained closed in a fitful kind of way, and torturous seconds dragged on before the sound of Grandma's footfalls grew close. Now what in the world? I swallowed and looked up, and the frozen expression on Grandma's face brought a wave of tear-laden emotion over me. I told you she was sick, I choked. Heavier footsteps sounded on the timber floorboards, and I sat up on the bed to stare at Jerome in a terry toweling robe. From the suds in his hair, it sounded like he didn't get that shower finished. What's wrong? His eyes flashed an eerie amber color. Is Sharon all right? I shook my head a little dumbly. Marissa, Grandma hollered. You get up here right now. Grandma edged me out of the way so she could likewise make her inspection with a palm pressed against Mom's forehead. Not that two witches with only hexes and a green thumb between them could hope to do much about diagnosing a mystery illness. That was Mom's forte. That was why she was never sick a day in her life. Marissa squeezed past Jerome, but I wasn't listening to what she was saying. It all seemed completely unreal. What were we supposed to do in this kind of situation? How did regular folks go about these kinds of things? The only time I'd ever been to hospital was after the car crash on the road trip back home from California, and Mom had whisked me out of there just as soon as she arrived from the other direction. Take her to the hospital? Marissa's voice sounded shaky, and Jerome said something about grabbing his keys. No, Grandma barked. This ain't right. Of course it isn't, I swallowed. Mom's never sick but it's not like she can whip up a remedy for herself right now. We'll have to trust in the more mundane methods. I said it ain't right. Grandma pulled her hand away from Mom's brow with her brows knitted together. I knew there was something. This isn't sick, Cat. Those bad omens I mentioned. Well, I reckon this is it. Magical? My eyes widened. But that's absurd. Who the heck would want to hurt Mom? The question hung in the air for a moment until Mom made the slightest of groans. She didn't rouse, though, and I shared a helpless look with Marissa. Whatever it is, it's subtle. I can feel magic, but it's like my senses want to shy away from it. Grandma looked over her shoulder at Jerome. Was she okay before going to sleep last night? The poor guy looked truly shaken, standing there in a damp robe with his jaw working. Right as rain. I woke before the sunrise and went out for a walk. She barely stirred when I got up. We were wasting time. If Grandma thought it was some kind of magical attack, and Mom was this unwell so quickly, it didn't bode well at all. Marissa, tell me there's something in your cauldron for this kind of thing. Some kind of cure you keep Mom stocked with in the clinic? Marissa's chest heaved, and her eyes filled with tears as she stared at Mom's still form. I, I'm not a healer, Cat. Mostly the things I brew are for particular ailments, I'm no good at figuring out what the cause is. Potions ain't gonna fix this, Grandma's face twisted in the scowl. No, what we need are the grimoires down here and pronto. If it's a spell's what done it, it'll be a spell that'll put things right. How do we know it was a spell and not a poison, I countered. A magical poison would leave a trace too. We can't just go firing off spells willy-nilly and hope one will work. Well, what do you suggest, Grandma snapped. It's not like we can take her to a doctor. The only healer I'd trust is Cordelia Phelps, and she's all the way across the border. I blinked. Healer. Or this Peggy woman over in Darley? Do you think she had a grudge against Mom over this rivalry thing? If we could identify the source of this malaise, we could go about fixing it a lot quicker. Grandma fixed me with a scowl and tutted in irritation. How, Cat? You really think Peggy popped by while we were up all night and shoved a brew down her throat? Mom made another pitiful sound, and Marissa sat on the bedside and took her hand. If you two are going to spend the next hour arguing about this, will you at least take it downstairs? She's a healer, for goodness sake. For all we know, she could be in a trance right now, putting things right. 
Your barking isn't helping. Grandma recoiled. It wasn't like Marissa to be sharp with her. I stood and ran my fingers through my hair, my mind racing. As much as I wanted to stay with mom, the room felt claustrophobic with all of us huddling over the bed. And Jerome's not quite dressed state was off-putting. Let's all get out of here so Jerome can get some clothes on. I gave him what I hoped wasn't too awkward a smile. We need to figure out what to do. Grandma stared at mom for a few lingering moments before cursing under her breath and getting off the bed. Marissa followed her, and I bit my lip as I stepped around Jerome to the doorway. The man gave me a somewhat appreciative look before sitting on the bed by mom, and awkward or not with the state of their relationship, the concern in his eyes comforted me. As much as one could be comforted in that kind of situation. It ain't no poison, Grandma protested as she followed Marissa down the stairs. For one thing, Sharon wouldn't have taken it, and it's too sloppy. No, this must be hex magic and we're wasting time. We need every set of eyes on the grimoires to narrow the playing field. A hex? I trotted downstairs closely on Grandma's heels, trying to figure that into the rapidly developing situation. Undoing a hex sounded risky. It was the source we needed, and the only hex witch I knew of who might have it in for Mom was... Blanche Baker, I blurted. If it's a hex, then it's her for sure. Blanche? Marissa stopped short at the bottom of the staircase and shot me a quizzical look. What's she got to do with it? The look on Grandma's face told me she'd already caught my meaning. But I clarified in a low voice lest Jerome overhear the conversation. I had a run-in with her yesterday at the bakery. She's not happy with the, uh, new relationship. Marissa's eyes flared with indignation, and she craned her head to look up at the landing before bustling off to the kitchen. Following her, I spotted Jake through the window under the hood of Mom's truck, likely unaware of the commotion. Now tell me why someone with a bee in her bonnet would do something as drastic as this, Marissa hissed and pointed at the ceiling. I'm sure there's been talk, but that's a pretty serious allegation. Grandma was strangely quiet as she went to fill the kettle, so I took a deep breath and shrugged. I don't know, I'm just trying to figure this out. I saw Blanche at the bakery yesterday, and she was downright rude to me. We all know she's prickly, but this was something else. It's not like Mom has much by way of enemies, and Blanche is the only hex witch I can think of who might have cause. I'll wring that woman's neck. Grandma thumped the yet-to-be-washed baking tray down on the kitchen counter. That anyone would have the gall to curse my flesh and blood is just... Well, they're either stupid or deranged. Either way, it's the last hex that woman will ever cast. You think she's right? Marissa squawked. Oh, come on, this is crazy. We need to be focusing on getting Aunt Sharon better, not plotting revenge. So what? We pile her into the car and go on a road trip to see Cordelia. Last time I checked, Mom didn't offer unhexing procedures to her patients. I paced the kitchen. But I still say this Peggy woman has more motive to be coming after Mom. What did it feel like, Grandma? What does your gut tell you? Grandma seemed to stare into space as she considered the question. Like I said, it was subtle. I'm no diviner. Could be hex magic. Though I'd say if that were the case, it was cast a while ago and just coming to fruition now. Someone with a good amount of skill can do it that way. But I can't unequivocally rule out poison either. An unknown magical method of delivery and no clear way to discern one from the other. Great. And how would a hex witch go about undoing another witch's hex? Grandma's lips twisted and her eyes narrowed. Depends on what kind of hex. By the time we figure that out, we could have taken her to Cordelia to be seen to properly, Marissa said. Aunt Sharon wasn't in the habit of undoing hexes, but she knew if there was a magical cause. Maybe even as well as a diviner. Cordelia Phelps was a good four-hour drive away. I knew that because of the times I'd sat in the passenger seat as a kid with Mom making the trip with a trailer on the back with whatever patient she was caring for at the time. They were on good terms and pooled their cures together to get the job done when critter or person alike were in need. You really want to drag mom all the way there in that condition? I asked. When we have two people who might have been responsible just around the corner, 
Blanche might be a mean woman, but I doubt she would have the nerve to hex a crow. This Peggy woman is an unknown quantity. I say you and me head over to Darley to pay her a visit while Grandma looks over the grimoires. That way we're working on both ends. Marissa's shoulders dropped, but she nodded while Grandma drew herself up to her full five and a half feet while bristling. You ain't leaving me behind. What are you going to do when you confront her? Wither her garden? I gritted my teeth. Grandma didn't hide the fact she thought my magical green thumb was ineffectual at best, but that didn't mean I was powerless. If there's any chance you can dispel this safely, then you should be here trying to do just that. And if it turns out Peggy didn't have a hand in it, well, maybe she can help. We've got to try. Grandma, Marissa's voice was as smooth as honey. It'll take less than an hour to get back here, maybe with a healer to help. You're the only one with the skill to see a hex straightened out, if that's the cause. I promise I'll scour every old spell book in the attic when I get back. Grandma looked between me and Marissa and sighed. Fine, just don't dawdle. Chapter 5 I still don't know how you do that. I glanced at Marissa from the steering wheel of Jake's truck. Marissa's fiancé seemed reluctant to hand over his vehicle to us when my cousin got him up to speed on the situation, but with only two seats and Mom's engine in pieces, he'd handed the keys to me rather than Marissa. Do what? Marissa still looked a little irked, either about Jake's confidence in her driving skills or the situation we were in. Grandma, I could argue that the sky was green all day long and she wouldn't have any of it. You come in and she'd be telling me that the sky being green was her idea. You gotta stop trying to be right with her. You're both the same. If you'd just relinquish the higher ground now, and then you'd have an easier time convincing her. Marissa chewed her lip. Besides, what I said was true. You seem keen on this Peggy Gordon being the culprit, but it's a long shot at best. Maybe for a regular person it would be. I tapped the steering wheel with my fingers. But a healer? She could have given mom whatever it is weeks ago, and it's been dormant until now. I've seen mom set bones to grow back over weeks after treatment. And you think Peggy could have spelled her without her knowledge? Marissa scoffed. That'd be hard enough to pull off on a regular witch, let alone one who shares the same craft. It's hex magic that's sneaky. I'll tell grandma you said that. I took a deep breath, my voice flat despite the friendly dig. But honestly, when was the last time something like this ever happened in our family? And to mom, of all people, she's never done anyone wrong. Marissa didn't answer right away, and I turned at a sign marked Darley. I knew roughly where I was headed and didn't need to look at the scrawled note grandma handed to me to check the address. Other than the time dad said someone pulled a hex on him at school, I can't think of anything like this happening in the family. This is feud stuff, Kat. You hear about magical families squabbling over power, but not in tumbling springs. Yeah, well, maybe in Virginia they do things differently. I gripped the wheel and hit the gas, determined to make good time. Have you had any run-ins while you've been home with folks who are whispering behind mom's back? No, but dad said there had been a few things said in town. He said not to worry, though. One of his mechanics, Max, is aware. And from what dad can tell, the pack don't have a beef with Jerome. Something about him being courteous about their territory and checking in with their alpha when he arrived. I was glad to hear it. Uncle Henry ran the only repair shop in town, and while he wasn't magically inclined, folks held him in high regard in the mostly magical community. It didn't surprise me to hear he had a ware working for him, and if there was a problem on the ware side, then I supposed he would be the best place to hear about it. Do wares even do magic? I frowned, wondering why I wouldn't know something as basic as that. Aside from spotting one here and there out in the woods in their shifted form, I couldn't recall an instance of a weir casting a spell. I don't suppose it might have been one of them, would it? I doubt it. Marissa looked equally puzzled. I've made a brew here and there for the odd wolf, mostly remedies that didn't require a healer, but they mostly keep to themselves, so it's hard to say they probably kept to themselves on account of witches being higher on the food chain, I mused, unless wares likewise had a global arcane council on the down low. 
I guess I always assumed they were in Tumbling Springs as a kind of refuge from the regular world. It was one of the few places where the supernatural wasn't all that much of a secret. But let's not go starting a war here. Marissa folded her arms. Last thing we need is to go pointing the finger at everyone in town. We should just ask Penny some questions, see if we can get her on our side. And hopefully by the time we get back, Aunt Sharon's put herself right inside a trance. Questions? Like, did you happen to inflict a magical malaise on Sharon Crow? And would you kindly set it right at your convenience? Yeah, I see that going down well. Well, what do you suggest? We need a game plan here. We're five minutes away. I chewed my lip. If she was the one behind it, she's not just going to come out and admit it. We need to pretend that we're there seeking her services for mom and watch her reactions like a hawk. I doubt she'd make a house call if she was the one behind it. Or maybe that would be the perfect opportunity to inflict more harm, Marissa tutted. Now I'm sounding like you. It's the best plan we've got right now. Unless you have a truth-telling serum up your sleeve? You know how brutal those are to brew? Marissa curled her lip. And I've barely got any supplies. I took a couple of suitcases to Texas on my last trip. I sighed. Of course she did. I turned onto a dirt road, which I knew cut across to the lane I was seeking and slowed to avoid bottoming out in one of the many potholes. Perhaps Marissa was right, and this was a waste of time. If we had nothing by the time we got back, I promised myself to get to the task of searching the grimoires for something that might help. It had been a long time since there was a diviner in the family, but maybe the more decrepit books held noteworthy incantations. When we pulled up to a property which looked like it had seen better days, I frowned at the padlocked gate. The house was a good few hundred yards away, sitting in a stark field of freshly turned dirt. I unbuckled my seatbelt to hop out of the truck. Even with non-magical folks, it wasn't a good idea to climb over a locked gate uninvited. As witches, we had the odd charm here and there at home to warn off those with ill intentions at the boundary line. But I didn't drive all the way out there to sit and stare. Come on, we better go check it out. There isn't even a sign up with a number to call. Marissa frowned and leaned forward to stare out the windscreen. Doesn't look all that inviting for a clinic. Darley isn't like Tumbling Springs. It's not like she can put up a magical healer sign and not draw notice. I'll bet she decided not to take any more cases this close to Christmas is all. Marissa swallowed but nodded, so I jumped out and over a puddle on the driveway and locked the truck with a click of the key fob. The sun had done little to break through the icy air, and my breath fogged as I rubbed my hands together. The gate seemed innocuous enough, but my mind conjured the image of getting an electric shock when I laid my hands on it. Maybe the fence, huh? I jerked my thumb toward the wire and post fence, which only had barbs on the top strand. The dirt underneath it looked muddy, and while I didn't have any qualms with messing up my gardening boots, Marissa's looked less like work boots and more like something that just marched off a catwalk. You gotta be kidding, right? Marissa's face dropped. I'm not touching that gate. I shrugged, but you go on ahead and try your luck. Marissa groaned as she followed my gaze to the gate and folded her arms. The offer to test it out didn't appear to be appealing, so I picked my way over to a saggy part of the boundary fence and squelched through mud to duck and squeeze through. There was no unpleasantness, mud aside, from any protective wards, and I nodded to Marissa after climbing through. While I usually would have relished the sight of Marissa getting her footwear messed up, I kept my eyes on the house as she grumbled and moaned her way over. But our intrusion didn't appear to have stirred up any activity. You're gonna get us arrested at Christmas for breaking and entering. You know that, right? Oh, hush. Just friendly visitors calling on the talented healer we've heard so much about. Sure. We got back to less muddy ground on the gravel drive and strode briskly toward the house. I couldn't spot any lights, but with the sun up, that didn't say much. What told me more was a lack of animal-related sounds. Running a clinic was a noisy gig. I begrudgingly spent my teenage years waking with the sun from all manner of hollering coming from the barn, and there wasn't a single dog barking at our approach. Cat, I don't think she's not home. Not with any patience, at least. My stomach sank as I shared a look with Marissa, and we hustled up toward the wide porch. 
At the door, I glanced in through a crack in the curtains in the front window and noted the darkened living room. Given the padlocked gate, there was no friendly bee back in five up on the door, so I went to walk around the side of the house when Marissa grunted. She had her phone out, and despite the timber-sided wall of the house being liberally caked in cobwebs, she leaned back to rest her head against it. What is it? I frowned. We're both stupid is what? She shook her phone at me. Wasted trip. I just checked her out on Witchy Web. She marked herself as out for the season last week and wishes us all a Merry Christmas. I dragged a hand across my face and refrained from cursing. We were indeed stupid. Crap, that's why it's so quiet. I'll bet that barn is empty. You still think she might be involved? I took a deep breath as I considered the question. If Peggy Gordon left town a week ago and was clever enough to have buried some magical mystery illness in mom before leaving, it would give her a nice alibi. But shutting up shop for Christmas and heading presumably home to Virginia wasn't in and of itself suspicious. I don't know. But I doubt there's anything here that'll help us. We need to get back to Grandma. If she hasn't found anything, then maybe we should try to get Mom over to Cordelia Phelps. Marissa was kind enough not to give me an I told you so face and simply followed me back to the truck. I still thought Blanche was unlikely to be behind something as heinous as Mom's condition, but then her attitude at Cherry's had come as a surprise, too. We got into the truck and turned back onto the road toward home. My mind churned as we sat in silence. I supposed one of us should have called Grandma to let her know what we'd found, but Marissa didn't offer, and I wasn't ready to be hosed down over wasted time yet either. I'm not sure why I noticed the jerky movement of a brownish shape on the side of the road coming into Tumbling Springs, but almost without thinking, I turned sharply and pulled off the asphalt. What are you? There's something behind us. Looks like it's injured. I unbuckled and went to hop out of the truck to Marissa's protests. You think now's the time to be collecting nearly roadkill? It's not like Aunt Sharon's in a fit state to be taking on an emergency case. I ignored my cousin and hopped out. There was a knot in my stomach pushing me onward, and it wasn't until I jogged the 50 yards back down the road that I realized why. A barn owl lay on its side, a wing jerking as I got near. Except it wasn't any old barn owl. I dropped to my knees beside the bird and brushed a finger against its feathered cheek. It was Henrietta, my mother's familiar. Chapter 6 Marissa found a dirty old towel in the back of Jake's truck, which we used to wrap Henrietta into a bundle, and she cradled the bird tenderly as I hot-footed it back home. From what we could see, there didn't appear to be any obvious broken bones, though Henrietta lay limp and lethargic, not responding to our telepathic communication. This can't be coincidence, Marissa stated. Nope, I agreed. I didn't particularly want to open the can of worms Henrietta's condition brought to the fore, but I knew Grandma would hit the roof when she saw the owl. Even without the gift, I was almost certain a healer wasn't capable of attacking both witch and familiar with their skills. But the link a witch shared with their ancestral spirit-turned-animal was fair game for a hex witch, whose gifts they directed at a person's soul stuff rather than their physical body. Well, Marissa snapped, are we going home, or should we head Grandma off at the pass and go directly to Blanche? I blinked and glanced at Marissa, whose normally affable countenance was replaced by a mask of cold fury. I blinked and returned my attention to the road. Go directly to Blanche and do what, exactly? She might take more offense to her garden withering than most people, but it's not exactly the thumbscrews we need. Unless you have some poison in your pocket and plan on threatening to pour it down her gullet. I wouldn't be beneath it if I did, but spells or no, I say we head straight over and demand she start rescinding before she unleashes a feud. A bit late for that, wouldn't you say? Besides, we need to check in with Grandma. She might have had some luck with the grimoires. Marissa grunted something that sounded like yes, so I turned off the highway before the township of Tumbling Springs to cut directly to home. The trip back seemed to take twice as long, and I warred with irritation, anger, and fear that Mom's condition had worsened since we'd been gone. When I pulled up at the house, 
I launched up to the porch and stomped into the hallway, muddy boots and all. Gone long enough, Grandma called out from the top of the stairs. With the presence of mind to kick off my boots before heading up to the carpeted second floor, I took the stairs two at a time. Instinctively, I went straight for Mom's room and found Grandma with a chair pulled up by her bedside with a stack of leather-bound grimoires beside her. Any change? I crossed the room to sit on the bed and took Mom's hand. Nothing, but she ain't getting no worse, which is something. Grandma rubbed her eyes and stretched her shoulders. What do you girls find? I glanced at the doorway where Marissa had caught me up, less her muddied designer boots, with Henrietta bundled in her arms. She went over to lay the owl gently next to Mom. Peggy Gordon is out for the season. There was nothing at the house, but we found Henrietta on the trip back. Grandma leaned in to inspect the bird closely and untucked the towel to run fingers down her sleek chest. Her features were frozen, but her eyes glinted as she unfolded a wing. I didn't feel the need to tell her about our own conclusions and instead bit my lip, waiting for Grandma to speak. Snapping shut the book on her lap and hurling it across the room, Grandma stood and bunched her fists at her side. That's it, she screeched. I'ma give that woman what she deserves. I'll curse her entire family. You just wait. Blanche Baker is gonna regret she was ever born. Grandma, I caught her hand and looked into her eyes. We need her to fix this. Deserved or not, we can't fight fire with fire right now. Grandma cast a baleful glare at me, then turned to Marissa. You go get my traveling case and my hat. I'll bring the full authority of the Arcane Council with me. Katerina, get out into that garden and dig up some Jezebel roots. I mean to show that Harridan, I mean business. I swallowed and squeezed Mom's clammy hand. Grandma in full Arcane Council regalia spitting curses on Christmas Eve. It sounded like something I should try to talk her out of, except, well, if it got Mom out of this jam, then it would be worth it. I nodded slowly then frowned as I realized I hadn't seen Jerome since coming back. Ah, where's Jerome gotten to? I stood to look out of the window where Jake was still working away on Mom's truck. I guessed it was awkward for the guy to be hanging around with the family in such a tizzy. Went for a walk to blow off some steam? Grandma waved her hand. We'll put this right before he even gets back. Now, she clicked her finger. Jezebel roots. The root in question was something that I would usually dry in the gardening shed for Grandma's stores, but with my long absences, I doubted there was any left. More commonly known as the Dixie Iris, the plant was notoriously fussy, and I hoped the crop I kept near the pond was still thriving. Will fresh do? I stood and headed to the doorway. Marissa has already scooted off to collect the rest. I'll take whatever I can get. With one last, lingering look at Mom, I left her under Grandma's ministrations and headed downstairs. I wasn't sure if Grandma was planning on setting up a cursing ritual right on Blanche Baker's lawn, perhaps between her tacky flamingo yard ornaments and rose bushes, or if she intended to wave the ingredients under the woman's nose until she relented. Either way, this would be a Christmas tumbling springs wouldn't forget any time soon. After stepping into my boots and heading out the door, I startled Jake, who bumped his head on the hood of Mom's truck and turned. Engine grease smears aside, he looked worried, set his wrench down, and fell into step beside me as I made a beeline for the garden shed. How's everything going in there? He scratched the back of his head. Is there anything I can do to help? As a non-magic user, I couldn't help but feel for the guy caught in the middle of a magical brouhaha. There was exactly nothing he could do to help, and I supposed the same was true for Jerome as a shifter. We're about to head into town. I opened the squealing door to the shed and grabbed some gloves, a bucket, and a hand shovel. Have you seen Jerome? I'd feel better if someone was sitting with Mom while we're out. Ah, uh, Jake turned to peer across the garden toward the woods. He went that way. Didn't say nothing to me. He looked fit to be tied. I can watch over your mom if you need. Angry? Well, I supposed we all were. But wouldn't the loving boyfriend want to stay by the bedside of his new lady love? Thanks. I've just got to round up some supplies from the garden, then we'll be leaving. I considered the two seats in Jake's truck and the state of Mom's engine, parts littered on the gravel drive. 
I don't suppose you know if Grandma's Toyota is in working order. So far as I know, I can get it out of the garage if you like. That'd be great. Leaving Jake with a job he could handle, I made my way in the direction Jerome had left, which also led me to the pond that provided moist soil for growing plants as fussy as Dixie Iris. I couldn't see anyone lurking in the trees, and with the adjacent property being a national forest, I didn't think I should try catching up to him out there. I'd only lose time. As I approached the pond, I was encouraged when I spotted clumps of green right where I left them. As a green witch, I had a pretty unfair advantage over the average gardener and did my best to leave protective charms on both the soil and plants when I knew I'd be gone for a while. It wouldn't save me from all mishaps, though, particularly when growing specimens that weren't tolerant of Arkansas conditions. The boggy ground in which the Dixie iris thrived was treacherous in December. I was careful as I trudged into the squelching mud, and after getting my tools in order, I stopped and frowned at a new green stalk thrusting up through the soil closer to the edge of the woods. It wasn't a place I typically used for gardening, and after pulling up and cutting some roots from the iris, I tracked over to inspect it more closely. The leaves had finger-like lobes, each lobe itself tri-lobed and toothed. Wolfsbane, I muttered under my breath. The plant did exactly what it said on the box, repel werewolves from a particular area, but only in large quantities and when the hooded blue flowers were in bloom. A particular poison, which was best extracted from either the roots or seeds, was well documented as more lethal to wares than humans, but I'd never had cause to grow much of the stuff, and I certainly had nothing to do with that particular plant. I frowned out into the trees, hoping I might spot Jerome, but all looked quiet out there. I doubted the wolfsbane did much more than smell unpleasant to him, so the question was, why was it there? It wasn't like there were any other green thumbs in the family, the stalk itself was only up to my hip, which meant it had a lot more growing to do to reach its full height. I bent to run a hand down to the base of the plant to feel the soil underneath. The damp earth felt freshly turned, and I frowned as I rocked the plant back and forth. Newly transplanted, I'd say within the last week or so, who the heck would have done something as weird as plant wolfsbane on the property tucked away in a corner even I didn't regularly frequent? My indignation was cut short when Jerome emerged from the tree line further along the boundary where a gravel path led up to the house. I waved to catch his attention and he changed course to stride toward me, his hands thrust in his pockets. Any change, he asked. His nose twitched and he stared at the wolfsbane at my feet with a frown creasing his brow. I wondered if he thought I was responsible for the fresh addition to the garden, but seeings as he didn't do more than frown at it, I tried to bring him up to speed as concisely as I could. So, we're heading over to Blanche Baker's now so Grandma can have a showdown with her. I came out to dig her up some Jezebel roots but found this. I nudged the plant with my boot and narrowed my eyes as I tried to puzzle it out. Blanche is a fair gardener. This whole situation is weird. It could have been her who put it out here. I can't see why, though. Jerome nodded slowly. And was that relief in his eyes? Having a course of action and a likely culprit was better than nothing, but Mom was still up in the house, unconscious. If this Blanche woman took issue with me hanging around, then it makes sense. What can I do to help? I didn't mention that Blanche would have known full well that a single scraggly plant would have been useless against him. Maybe another witch would have thought it was sufficient, but not a hex witch who, for the most part, grew her own supplies. I don't know if it's a good idea to come with us. It might only make things worse, but I'd feel better knowing someone was watching over Mom. Jerome's jaw tightened at the dismissal, but he agreed to stay behind and call should things take a turn for the worse. Reminded of the need for haste, I left the wolfsbane behind and fetched my bucket of Jezebel roots before trotting back to the house. The sun was already overhead, behind ominous gray clouds for the most part, I'd spent the night holding vigil, Mom was incapacitated, and we were about to unleash a world of trouble in Tumbling Springs. Not what I'd expected when booking the tickets back home for Christmas.
Chapter 7 Piling out of Grandma's crammed Toyota at Blanche Baker's house wasn't exactly what I'd call intimidating. Not with Grandma having to write the tip of her felted pointed hat, which had flattened on the drive over, and Marissa wrestling Grandma's traveling case of hexing supplies out of the trunk. But the look on Grandma's face made it plain she meant business, and Blanche was waiting on her porch by the time we approached the house on the paved walkway between orderly rows of rose bushes and garden ornamentation. What can I do for you, Sybil? Blanche had her arms folded and looked Grandma up and down. I don't suppose you got lost? There ain't a council meeting in my house, I can assure you. Blanche Baker, I, as an appointed member of the Arcane Council, demand you rescind the hex you laid upon my kin before I bring down the full weight of the law down around your shoulders. As an invitation to feud, you should know I will show no mercy and give no quarter. Your family shall suffer for generations to come. I'll, what are you talking about? Blanche snapped. Grandma's lip curled. Don't you play coy with me. Is this about her? Blanche leveled a finger at me. I saw your granddaughter at Cherry's, but if you think I cursed her, then you're more addled than people think. I cringed as Grandma's face turned an ugly shade of purple and glanced around the street where I was sure more than one or two folks were peeping out the curtains. If the war of words got much louder, I was sure we'd have the neighbors pulling folding chairs and popcorn out into the street before long. Cat? Grandma frowned and glanced back at me. You ought to be ashamed of talking down to my granddaughter, but you know darn well it's Sharon we're talking about. Sharon? Blanche's eyes widened momentarily, but replaced the expression with a nasty scowl. If she's earned herself any bad juju, that ain't on me. That's the Earth Mother making her wrath known. Why, a witch and we're copulating. That's an insult to her great gifts. Marissa clucked and shook her head, and I shared a look with my cousin. She'd called my Uncle Henry and Aunt Maxine on the trip over who were heading to the house to check in on Mom. And while I thought she'd come along to keep Grandma in check, the look on her face seemed like she was out for blood. Thought you'd do the Earth Mother's will then, huh? Don't you be pretending it wasn't you, Blanche. That's the act of a coward and a bigot, hiding behind your interpretation of the divine to spread your hate. You watch me openly curse your bloodline right here on the lawn for all to see. I don't need a hide to do what's right. Blanche's arms had dropped, and she clenched her fists at her sides as she heaved deep breaths through gritted teeth. You ain't all that Sybil Crow. A has-been at the head of a dwindling family, determined to clutch at power you have no right to. The council will have your hide for this. You mark my words. I'll testify myself to the fact you've lost your mind. Threats on my kin? I'm sure the Inquisitors will be interested to hear about that. Then rescind the hex, Grandma screeched. There ain't another witch for miles with the nous to cast something as sneaky as that under my very nose. You think I give a fat froggy's bottom what an Inquisitor will think when my flesh and blood is laid up? Don't test me, Blanche. I'm ready to start a war. Blanche rolled her eyes and glanced at a spot behind me. I looked over my shoulder to see one or two people out on their own lawns, some of whom had the odd item in hand to make their gawking just a little less obvious. You see in this, she hollered. Your esteemed council member, Sybil Crow, is making threats on me and mine. You're all witnesses. I narrowed my eyes at Blanche, and while she looked madder than a wet hen on the surface, I thought there was a flicker of fear in her eyes. Was it that we'd caught her out, or something else? We just want Mom back to normal, I pleaded. It's Christmas Eve for Pete's sake. If you've got a beef with her relationship with Jerome, surely it isn't worth threatening her life. She's never done this town wrong. Blanche's attention snapped toward me, and her frown looked more puzzled than angry. Her life? What is it you're accusing me of, girl? Hex magic or murder? This is the most ridiculous. Then why did Cat find Wolfsbane on the property? Marissa spat. Freshly planted, too. You're the only green thumb I know who's been openly slandering our family in town with the hex magic to cause something like this. Wolfsbane, Blanche made a face. What? You think I wanted to give that were a runny nose while magically assaulting a witch? This is absurd. Sharon's probably home right now out in that barn of hers. And y'all are just here fixin' for trouble. Get off my property. It was Grandma's turn to screech a litany of insults, but I had stopped listening. 
While belligerent, I didn't think the look on Blanche's face was that of a guilty culprit, and she was right on account of the wolf spain. If it was a clue, it ruled her out and not in. We were wasting time, and if I didn't put a stop to this soon, Grandma would call a pox on the bakers and bring about her own political ruin. Grandma, let's go. I tugged at her sleeve and used a firm voice. This is getting us nowhere. We need to get back to Mom and get this rescinded ourselves. Both Grandma and Blanche turned surprised looks to me, and I reckoned it was the first time Blanche believed that a hex on Mom was real. Her jaw worked some, but Grandma turned her ire to me. Don't you be telling me what's what, Katerina Crow. I'll stay just as long as it takes to get this hag to make things right. This was going to be harder than it looked, and while my gut was telling me that Blanche wasn't our culprit, my mind was fixed on the people we hadn't looked into yet. I stared into Grandma's eyes, silently pleading for her to step down, and searched for the words to let her know what I was thinking, without tipping off the entire street who were surely in eavesdropping range by now. We need to go. I spoke slowly and calmly. Trust me, I have an idea. Grandma snorted and glared at Blanche. It had better be a good one, Katerina. I've a mind to put those Jezebel roots to use right here and right now. While the comment clearly wasn't aimed at me, I jumped on it before Blanche could fire back any counter threats. Well, hopefully nobody will need no Jezebel roots if I'm right about this. And I'm sure Blanche ain't going nowhere. If I'm wrong and we still have a quarrel on our hands, I'll bring you right back. I swallowed and hoped Grandma would take my word, but was prepared to drive off on my own if I had to and leave them to duke it out. Fine, Grandma spat, then swiveled to stick her finger in Blanche's face. But you haven't heard the last of this, not by a long shot. Marissa quirked an eyebrow at me as she manhandled Grandma's case back into the trunk, but I only gave her a warning look. It wasn't until the folks on Blanche's street were firmly in the rear view that both Grandma and Marissa started firing off their questions. The heck did you think you were doing back there? She'll be readying counter curses is what she'll be doing while we're gone. Evidence points to her. Quiet, I snapped. Blanche isn't stupid enough to plant wolfsbane on the property. She's right. It didn't even bother Jerome. The woman knows a thing or two about plants. You know what was weird, though? Jerome looked relieved to find it there after his walk in the woods. The second time he'd gone wandering off today. Don't you think he would have preferred to stay by mom's side if he was worried about her condition? What are you playing at, Cat? He's a man, and a wolf at that. Why, your grandfather turned green at the sight of me in pain. Men are delicate creatures in the face of women's troubles. All I'm saying is that we never asked Jerome a single question about who he thought might be behind this. And what do we know about him, really? That he's a lone wolf with no family who happened to have swept mom off her feet? We've been racing around trying to pin this on people who have a grudge, but this is a lot more serious than a business rivalry or a petty woman's gossip. Grandma made a strangled sound, and I was glad we were only a couple of minutes from home. If I had to spend much longer than that putting up with Grandma defending the man, I'd scream. The fact she thought the world of him only convinced me there was something amiss about him. We'd soon find out the truth, though. I could feel it in my bones. Chapter 8 Aunt Maxine was downstairs with Jake in the living room when we got back to the house. Uncle Henry was presumably with Mom upstairs. It had started raining, and Grandma swept her pointed hat off in the hall and shook off droplets of water as she glared at me. Any luck? Aunt Maxine rushed over, wringing her hands. Not yet, Grandma growled. But I'll have a curse ready to sling by the time we get back there. Uncle Henry's head appeared above us over the stairwell. I met his eyes and swallowed. You want to get Jerome down here for me, Uncle? He frowned but nodded and I took a bracing breath. With the family hovering, this would be a tough line of questioning, and if Jerome had anything to do with this curse, I just hoped he would own up to it before things got worse. Jerome came down the stairs ahead of Uncle Henry, and I nodded toward the dining room and sidestepped Marissa to stride in there first. His pinched features spoke of worry, but that said little given the situation. By the time we sat, 
with everyone pulling up a seat except for Jake, who lingered in the doorway. The butterflies in my stomach were doing backflips. I stared Jerome down, though, and he met my eye for what it was worth. I thought it was about time we asked you what you thought about all this, Jerome, I said quietly. I've been racing around all day trying to figure out who is behind all this, and nothing fits. Peggy Gordon is out of town, and Blanche didn't do it. Grandma slapped a hand on the table. You say she didn't, but sure, she had a problem with the relationship. Half the town does. But this isn't just a run of bad luck hex. Blanche isn't stupid enough to start a war she can't win or end up in a magically bound cell over some moral aversion. I gripped my hands together on the table and cleared my throat. But Jerome, you've spent a lot of time out in the woods stomping around today. Is there any reason behind that? Have you got any ideas on who might wish mom harm? While I'd left the questions wide open, Jerome recoiled at the implication from my tone that he was involved. But I reckoned I'd hit the mark when his face twisted in anguish and he shook his head. It isn't those witches behind it. What about the wolfsbane? I thought, well, I guess I hoped it was. He took a deep breath and glanced at Grandma before continuing. You've got to believe me when I say that I had no intention of bringing trouble to your door. Grandma sat up a little straighter. What do you mean, trouble? My ex-wife. Jerome dragged his hands over his scalp. Antoinette. She's a werewolf shaman, and she's the reason I've had a hard time putting down roots for the past few years. Shaman, so words do use magic? I blinked and glanced at Marissa. And she's the kind of ex that would do something like this? And worse. Jerome closed his eyes for a moment. That's why we split. We were married for 20 years, living in Kentucky on a big parcel of land. No kids, but we were happy. As the loggers encroached on the surrounding area, well, at first it was a bit of environmental activism, until people started getting hurt. Annie Antoinette felt it was our land, every tree our children. She wanted blood for blood. She didn't take the breakup well, I asked. That's a bit of an understatement. She's caught up to me a few times before, but I thought this time I might have covered my tracks well enough. As a shaman, she has an edge on my ability to lie low. You think she's out in those woods? Grandma stared out the darkening window. Why didn't you just tell us in the first place? I, Jerome swallowed. Well, I guess it seemed like you ladies already had ideas about who was behind it, and part of me hoped it wasn't anti Annette. I've been scouring the woods to catch her scent, but if she's out there, she's using magic to keep herself hidden. I chewed my lip as I thought it through and decided I believed him. If a backstory was what I wanted from the guy, then at least this made some sense. A business rival and an old gossip didn't have enough motive for this kind of thing, but a crazed ex-wife might have. What are we up against, Grandma? I asked, breaking the silence. You know anything about these were shamans? Only that they peddle in crude magic. The council won't budge on bringing them into the fold, so most of what they do is passed down through the family or performed on pure intuition. You think you can find her cat? Marissa scraped her chair back and stood. Like with Rusty? Huh, Rusty, a shaggy old mutt from our childhood who liked to roam. Once, when he'd been gone for a couple of days, I'd used my magic to locate him in the woods through the spanning mass of roots of the old trees. I'd forgotten all about it, but I couldn't see why this would be any different, so I nodded in the affirmative. We'll need a binding spell. This won't be like with Blanche, Grandma warned. Sounds like this one won't go down without a fight. I'll go with Cat, Jerome held his hand up. If Antoinette is behind this, then I'll try to talk her down. She's dangerous when she's cornered. I'll do whatever it takes to get Sharon back in good health. Collectively, the family peered up at the ceiling, reminded of what was at stake. Jerome was right. There was no point of binding this woman until she'd put things right, and a lot could go wrong before the spell was set. How about we get some inquisitors down here? Uncle Henry frowned. I don't like the idea of stomping around the woods with a psychopath all bunkered up. We don't have time. Grandma pursed her lips. It's getting dark out, and I've got a feeling this hex has something to do with the moon. Jerome nodded. The moon is anywhere's guiding star, more so for a shaman. Jake cleared his throat from the doorway. What about the local wear pack? 
I'm friendly with Max down at the repair shop. I'd be glad to go and tell him what the situation is and ask if they can help track her down. Huh. I glanced at Grandma, who considered Jake with the slightest smile. This was crow family business, and with an aversion to magic or no, Jake was stepping up to the plate. It's worth a shot. Maybe- No, Jerome interrupted. Packs don't involve themselves in the affairs of others, much less us lone wolf types. Unless Auntie Annette has stepped on their toes, they'll see no reason to get involved. And even then, as a shaman, they might just side with her. Jake shrugged, leaving the decision to us, it seemed. Grandma rolled her eyes like pack politics was irksome, but nodded. Well, we aren't without means. I'll help with a protection charm, Sybil, Aunt Maxine said. For the house. Might take a fair amount of energy, but between you, me, and Marissa, we should be able to keep any malignant magic at bay while Jerome talks to the woman. And I'll go fetch some guns. Uncle Henry stood and nodded to Jake. Hope you're a good shot, son. No, please. Jerome's jaw tightened. She'll sniff out anyone trying to creep up on her. If she thinks I'm setting a trap, she might get trigger happy. Kat's scent is close enough to Sharon's for her to think perhaps it's her. I'll keep Kat safe with me. You have my word. You really think after holding this to yourself all day, I'm gonna trust you with my niece? Uncle Henry's eyes flared. I'll be fine, I said. I know those woods like the back of my hand. Green magic has to come in use for something, right? You just be careful out there. Grandma's eyes pierced mine, and if she doesn't relent, well, she can't use her magic if she's unconscious. You get what I'm saying? Do whatever you need to do. With Grandma's blessing on the plan, people began bustling around the house. Left without a job to do, Uncle Henry brooded over the coffee machine, while Marissa led Jake upstairs to collect supplies from the attic. I was pulling on my boots when Grandma took me by the elbow into the living room, and I gave her a questioning look as she pressed a finger to her lips. A tracking stone. She opened a small drawer in the sideboard. You just keep that in your pocket so I know where you're at. Protection charms my foot. Once you have that she-wolf cornered, I'll be ready to take her down. Just keep yourself safe until then. I'd thought perhaps Grandma had been a little too docile in agreeing to the plan, but as I stowed the flat, smooth stone in my pocket, I was gladdened that we had another trick up our sleeve. I'll be fine. The Woods and I are on good terms. Grandma winked at me and made off toward the stairs, leaving me to consider for a moment what other spells I had in my arsenal. After growing up in the woods, the trees around the house were like old friends, and I thought I could call on them with relative ease to protect me if I needed to avoid a physical assault. My soul stuff was a different story, though, as my familiar Gus might have helped in that respect, but Henrietta's condition suggested that this Auntie Annette was strong enough to bypass a familiar's protection. Here, take this. I startled out of my reverie and turned to see Jerome offering one of Mom's big winter coats. It'll help with the scent. I took the coat and inhaled the scent of bergamot mingled with the less pleasant odors of the barn. It caught me off guard and I swallowed a lump in my throat. I hoped fervently this plan would work. What could Jerome possibly say to get the woman to stand down? Sure. I slipped into the coat and zipped it right up to my chin. I'll fetch a flashlight. No need. Jerome's eyes flared in that otherworldly shade of amber. I'll do better without artificial light. I wasn't sure that would help me any, but I took a deep breath and nodded. Jerome was the first to head to the door, but after slipping out into the wet, rapidly fading light, he paused for me to take the lead. I'd considered how to go about the tracing most effectively, and without hesitation made for the pond and the wall of trees beyond the wolfsbane intruder. Will this draw her notice? Jerome whispered as he fell into step beside me. I doubt it, I said. Green magic is a particular craft. I'll be communing with the trees to locate her. Trees are big old gossips and send messages through their roots across the forest. Huh, Jerome said. Don't suppose they know I'm an arborist. I snorted. You've been swinging those chainsaws around out here? Only on the downy service berry down by the road. And I only took off Deadwood. I was surprised I missed that. 
Once this crazy situation was sorted out, I made a mental note to do a thorough inspection of the grounds and greenery. But gardens aside, we'd reached the first wide oak tree trunks, so I pressed my forehead and palms against the bark and flexed my inner magic muscle. My fingers warmed against the cold, slick surface, and a sizzle of energy through my body felt more like the embrace of an old friend than a shock. My soul stuff swelled as I prepared a series of images, rather than words in my mind, to communicate my need, and I sensed the roots buried deep underground twitching in response to the connection. Talking to trees was less talking, and more like an open flow of ideas which went both ways at once. The tree in question noted my absence from the woods and flickered images of myself as a girl stomping around under their friendly boughs. I, in turn, shared images of Mom's sickly face and the dark shape of a woman imbued with threat. A pattern began repeating itself with the adjacent trees also passing along their greetings, but I knew my message was also going the other way. I adjusted my tone to ask for haste, running through the forest with the moon in pursuit. In my trance, I couldn't rightly say how long it took before images began flashing back of a hollow and the traces of a glamour which would keep folks from seeing it properly to ensure they passed by. A blue tent sat erected at the bottom, and a red-headed woman on a log pressed fingers to her temples. She appeared to be staring right at me, and I startled almost enough to lose the connection. But I held steadfast until the trees could pass along a map of roots under the ground, which would lead me to the hollow. I held on to it even as I sent out my thanks and broke the connection and swayed a little as I blinked my eyes open. Did you find her? Jerome's eyes were intense and his nose twitched. If she's a redhead, then yeah. I rubbed my forehead and bolstered my magical energy to maintain the map in my mind. It was likely to drain fast after casting such a powerful spell. I narrowed my eyes and noted the faint glow on the ground where the roots that marked my path twined together and pointed to the right. This way. Jerome gestured for me to take the lead, and we both tracked out into the woods. Chapter 9 We didn't speak as I navigated forward. It was hard enough to keep the map maintained with my magic and keep from tripping over roots and undergrowth in the dwindling light. But with my enhanced magical perception, I sensed that Jerome was on high alert and ready to pounce. It was quite a trip ahead, and if Antionette's curse had anything to do with proximity, I thought she must have been a pretty powerful shaman to make Mom sick from so far away. With my task done, so to speak, I fretted over what else I could do to make sure this plan of Jerome's worked out. If Auntie Annette thought I was mom, she'd surely try to attack me if she thought we were on the offensive, and I worried that my mojo would be too weak to manage much. Was it that she wanted her husband back, or simply vengeance on the man who left her behind? What did Jerome plan on offering to have her relent? Finally, I sensed a spot up ahead where the tree roots ceased their direction, and the terrain began sloping down and not up. The hollow. I halted and held up my hand to signal to Jerome. In near darkness, the flash of his eyes was the only thing that told me he'd caught my meaning, and I pointed in the direction up ahead. He took the lead from there, and I hoped that glamour magic ran the same with wares as it did with witches. Which is to say that a glamour doesn't work on people who know the truth behind the illusion. As he trudged forward, I hesitated to let go of my magic, bracing for the dizzy feeling which usually followed. It hit me like a freight train, and I leaned on a nearby tree for support. A tingling feeling spread over my side, and I allowed the strength of the tree to soothe my soul stuff. But I didn't dare linger long. Not when Jerome was about to bust Auntie Annette's hidey hole right open. With an absent pat of the tree's rough bark, I pushed myself forward and tiptoed closer. I thought perhaps Jerome might have gone around the hollow unbeknownst until a shriek sounded, and my heart leaped into my throat. Jerome Jensen, you good-for-nothing traitor. She out there, that harlot you've been keeping? I winced and approached carefully, staying behind the shelter of the trees wherever I could. I'm sorry. Auntie Annette, please, just let her go. I'll do anything you want. 
I caught a glance of Jerome as I snuck a peek. He was on his knees with his hands up in supplication. I couldn't quite see the face of the woman who loomed over him as her long red hair hung around her face. Her aura crackled with energy, though, which told me she was wielding. You think you can sweet-talk me into letting your floozy off the hook? You're mine, and I plan on making sure the world knows it. It's not her fault, Jerome pleaded. It's mine. Don't punish her for my transgressions. Antionette heaved deep breaths with her fists bunched at her sides, and all I could think of was that this was about the strangest sight I ever saw. Every Hollywood concept of the alpha wolf and his obedient mate flashed before my eyes. Perhaps that was only true when the mate wasn't a shaman, and maybe the strength of a man should rightly be measured against the strength of his partner and his willingness to cede when the occasion called for it. But this hardly seemed like the time. If punishing her teaches you a lesson, then I don't see why I shouldn't, Auntie Annette spat. And I'll know for certain that she won't ever cause trouble again. Jerome pushed himself to his feet and stood head and shoulders taller than her. You could do that, and I'll run from you for the rest of my days. You'll have a fruitless hunt ahead of you. Is that what you want? I catch you every time, she snarled. And yet I keep running. Jerome reached for her hand. Let her go and I'll come willingly. You have my word. My heart stirred, though the couple in front of me didn't account for the emotion welling up inside. Jerome was willing to give himself up for mom, to the woman he'd apparently been evading for years. That was a grand gesture one would expect to see on the Hallmark Channel, not in the middle of the woods on a rainy Christmas Eve in Arkansas. I'll bind you to it, she warned. You'll make that oath to me in blood. Gross, I grimaced. Blood magic was seriously on the nose. Not before you make things right. Wrap me up in whatever magic you like, but I'll make no promises until I'm sure Sharon is well. Antionette flinched back, and for the first time, I caught a clear picture of her face. She bared her teeth in a snarl, and her amber eyes flashed menacingly. You pig! How dare you say her name to me? You aren't in any position to dictate terms. A sound somewhere far off caught my attention, the distant whirring of either a chainsaw or a motorbike. Both were odd given the time and conditions, but I tried to dismiss it and focus on what was in front of me. Both wares appeared to be too caught up in staring each other down to pay it any notice. Maybe not, but if I'm not satisfied that the curse is finished, I'm prepared to go to the ends of the earth to get away from you. Auntie Annette glared as she appeared to think it over, and I wondered at how someone could want their ex back so badly they'd be willing to coerce them into it. That wasn't love. But was that a flash of hurt that crossed her face? She must realize deep down that she could only keep him with threats. Bring her forward then, she sneered, so you can be satisfied that I'm holding my end of the bargain. I drew a sharp breath as I realized that meant me. But the whirring sound behind me was getting closer and not farther away, and I wondered how the noise wasn't bugging the wares. Weren't wolves supposed to have crazy good hearing as well as a sense of smell? Jerome glanced toward my hiding spot, but as his eyes continued scanning the surroundings, I could tell he was reluctant to reveal my location. You can do it from there just fine. And leave a witch in the shadows waiting to cast some of her nasty magic at me? I don't think so. She's a healer, not a... Healers can break bones as well as mend them. Even someone as blind as you should be able to see that. Auntie Annette, this wasn't going well, and now I was sure someone was approaching our location. If Auntie Annette didn't get this curse rescinded soon, this situation was fit to explode. I stepped around the tree into view and held my hands up. Auntie Annette's face twisted in rage. All right, let's keep this calm. I'm Sharon's daughter, Cat. Just a green witch nothing to get uppity about. I tracked you out here, and I can verify with the family if the curse has been lifted. I went to reach for my phone in the pocket of mom's coat, but Auntie Annette hissed. I held both hands up and wondered whether I could silently will a tree to fall on her. Hands where I can see them. Jerome, on your knees. I thought Jerome's fleeting look at me was that of irritation for revealing myself. He had told my family he would keep me safe, but at that point, I wasn't sure he could keep himself out of harm's way. 
He dropped to his knees and appeared unsurprised when Auntie Annette drew what looked like a ritual dagger from under her belt and circled behind him to hold it to his throat. You try any funny business and I'll unleash hell. You hear me? Her words were for me, and I nodded a little frantically. A certain magically infused stillness filled the air as she closed her eyes and turned her face up to the canopy, the moonlight shining on her face. She began muttering under her breath, and my skin crawled with an electric sensation. A spark exploded into flames near a log which I couldn't quite make out, but my best guess was that it was some kind of altar. Red smoke hissed from the flames, and as it filled the air, my nose itched with the acrid stench. Crap. Was I supposed to call Marissa now with this nut job holding a knife to Jerome's throat? The sound of what I was not sure was an engine of sorts was almost upon us, and I hoped fervently that whoever was coming didn't spoil the spell. If it was actually rescinding the curse and not igniting another foul spell. Light glanced over the trees behind me, and I turned with my hands still up. The headlights kept me from seeing the vehicle clearly, but from the shadows it looked like an all-terrain vehicle. A sickening howl sounded behind me, and I swung to stare at Auntie Annette's face half-shifted into an ugly, wolfish maw. Stepping back to press myself against a tree trunk lest I get mown over, I slapped my hands to my mouth, hoping Jerome's throat didn't get ripped open. But as Auntie Annette's muscles bulged, he rolled out and away from her grip and pushed himself to his feet. The ATV pulled up and the engine cut out just as Antoinette's legs shortened, and her arms, now her forelegs, dropped the dagger as she crashed down to the forest floor. Cat, lend me some strength. We'll need to finish this. Grandma? My jaw dropped as I glanced at the figure on the ATV. Grandma's usually severe bun had come undone, and wild iron gray hair stood out at every angle. She looked a little badass. I wasn't going to lie. By the time I helped her off the ATV, Auntie Annette's shift was almost complete, and her thick coat had a reddish tinge which matched her hair. She lay panting on the ground as I gripped Grandma's hand and allowed her to tap into my soul stuff. As my magic intertwined with Grandma's, I realized this wasn't just your everyday spell. This was old magic, the kind that threatened to rend the user's soul without enough conviction behind it. But we were talking about Mom here, if that didn't conjure the required mojo, I didn't know what would. I curse you, Auntie Annette Jensen, for the wounds inflicted on me and mine. You shall roam on four legs for the rest of your days. I bind your magic to keep those dear to me safe and compel you to leave this place. The ground under your paws shall feel like hot coals until you are far from tumbling springs. So flee now, before the pain becomes too much. A canine whimper answered the flash of magical energy surrounding her, and she lurched up to bound away. I kept holding Grandma's hand to lend her strength after the spell was done, and the silence was only spoiled when Jerome grunted and strode over. Where'd you come from? He rubbed his head and stared past us at the ATV. And what? Grandma cackled and pulled a stone similar to the one in my pocket from her coat. An old family relic, one to find and one to hide. You two all right? I nodded and narrowed my eyes at Jerome's neck. I thought perhaps she'd nicked him, but he waved a dismissive hand. I'm fine, but Sharon? Did Auntie Annette have time to fix it before? He swallowed. She shifted? Grandma snorted. Don't matter. I found a particularly useful passage in one of the grimoires. In wolf form, she can't hold a spell together beyond the transfiguration itself, the hex will dissipate if it hasn't already. And cut off from the source, she's stuck in that form. It was too dark to really tell, but it seemed like Jerome shuddered. I can't say I blamed him, but my phone beeped in my pocket, and I fished it out to stare at a text message from Marissa. She's awake and asking after y'all. Is everything okay? A strangled sound came out of my throat, and my eyes welled with tears. We better get home. Mom's awake. Chapter 10 It was Mom who sent me off to bed after we got home, and I'd sobbed on her shoulder in an incoherent babble. I'd been awake for 24 hours and was running on fumes. Knowing everything was okay, I'd fallen asleep almost as soon as my head hit the pillow, and when I woke it was full daylight out. 
daylight being in relative terms with the dark gray clouds hanging in the sky. In the kitchen, Mom kept her jaw set while Aunt Maxine insisted on doing the heavy lifting with Marissa to get the turkey cooked and the vegetables peeled. It was more than a little amusing to see the family fussing over her like she was the patient for the first time in her life, and she seemed reluctant to sit still with her coffee as the bustle of the day went on around her. In Arkansas, food is king, and having skipped two meals the day before, I'm not ashamed to admit that I ate like a horse. The sweet potato bake wasn't quite the same as mom's, but the rest of the spread, collard greens, mashed potatoes, cornbread dressing, and of course, the bird itself, was magnificent. There wasn't much time to get a pie prepared for lunch, but Aunt Maxine promised she had a chocolate pudding setting in the refrigerator before we all trudged into the living room in our collective gluttonous stupor. With the sofas crowded up, I sat on the floor beside the Christmas tree and handed out the presents I'd lugged all the way across the world, as goofy as they were. Mom got a stuffed toy kangaroo, and given Marissa's sweet tooth, I'd wrapped up a pack of Tim Tams for her to try. It was touristy trinkets, key rings and the like, for the others, but I bit my lip to keep from smirking as Grandma opened her cylindrical gift. Vegemite? She peered at the label with a frown. What's it for? Try it on toast, Grandma. I kept a mock severe face. You'll love it. Marissa, who had heard about my one and only experience with the terry-like substance which held Australian folks in its thrall, burst out laughing. Jerome cleared his throat as Grandma's expression sharpened, and he unwound his arm from around Mom's shoulder to sit forward in his seat. Now that the meal is done, I wanted the opportunity to say something to everyone. Uncle Henry's features became rigid. He'd been carefully polite throughout lunch, but I could tell he was still surly over everything. I know I brought trouble to your door, and I'll never forgive myself for putting Sharon in harm's way. Mom went to pat his knee and shook her head, but Jerome clasped her hand and met her eye. I want to apologize for not being candid about my past, and without Sybil and Kat to save the day, he swallowed. Well, things could have been a lot worse. I owe you all a debt of gratitude. I wondered if mom knew Jerome had been willing to offer himself up in exchange for her release. From Jerome's humble countenance, I doubted it. I made a mental note to have a quiet conversation with her later in the day, but it was grandma who spoke up in reply. Perhaps you shoulda. Told us, that is. But we was all running around with ideas on who was behind it. A little more deliberation on our part might have been warranted, she frowned. What I still don't understand is this Wolfsbane business. I have an idea on that, I piped up. It was a pretty easy jump to blame the hex on a witch with Wolfsbane on the property. I'll do a search of the grounds, but I suspect we might find more out there. I suspect it was Auntie Annette trying to throw us off the scent, pardon the pun, but any green witch worth her salt knows that a couple of half-grown plants wouldn't do much to a wear. If anything, she might have gotten itchy fingers planting them. Throw us off, Marissa made a face. What would that have accomplished? With mom out of the way. I bit my lip and shrugged. Auntie Annette lost her way and her mind years ago, Jerome said quietly. But she knew how much I detested the curses. My best guess is that she thought if I didn't know it was her behind it, I would go back to her eventually. She isn't much good at taking no for an answer. Marissa made a face and shuddered theatrically. Must have been a nightmare getting away from her. And she'll stay a wolf forever, Grandma? Probably. Grandma propped her legs on the ottoman in front of her wingback chair. She might seek another shaman of her kind who may be inclined to attempt reverse in it, but it would take someone with a high level of skill. Well, I'm just glad it's all done. Mom sat up a little straighter and leaned forward to clap her hands. I got the feeling that talking about Jerome's ex had gone on quite long enough for her. Now, more of these presents. I've got a stallion in the barn waiting on his bandages to be changed. Some things never changed, it seemed. I was about to drag out a much larger looking parcel from under the tree when my eyes caught at a flash of white out the window. Is that? I frowned. Don't tell me it's snowing out there, is it? Well, I'll be. Uncle Henry stood and put his fists on his hips as he stared outside. They kept saying it would.
Like kids in a candy store, we all made for the door, then out to the porch where we could get a better view. Snow in Arkansas was rare and almost unheard of on Christmas Day. Marissa dragged Jake out into it while Aunt Maxine took pictures and Mom snuggled into Jerome's side by the porch railing. Grandma kept her arms folded while she frowned out at the weather, and I sidled up beside her to ask her the question I'd been saving up all day. So, you and Blanche Baker, huh? You planning on taking a humble pie over there and apologizing for yesterday? Grandma's eyes widened and she glared, but I'd said it loud enough to be overheard, and Mom was the one who replied. What happened with Blanche Baker? Mom, of course, knew we suspected her, but we hadn't gone into great detail over the events of the day. The slightest hint of embarrassment shined through on Grandma's face before she grunted and made a face. That's between me and Blanche. And there'll be no need for groveling. Of that, you can be certain. I chuckled and shared a look with Mom, who raised her eyebrows. It didn't look like she was about to let it go, so I trotted down the stairs into the snow and slipped off into the garden. The conditions would play havoc with some of the fussier specimens out there, but with the Christmas curse out of the way, I had a few days to get my fingers into the dirt and have some proper downtime. Well, downtime for a green witch, anyway. Thank you for joining me in this enchanting holiday journey through A Curse for Christmas. I hope the festive magic warmed your heart as much as it did mine. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to my channel for more spellbinding adventures. Share your thoughts on this Yuletide novella or recommend your favorite holiday reads in the comments below. Your insights make this bookish community truly magical. If you enjoyed our festive escapade, give this video a thumbs up and spread the holiday cheer. Before you go, remember to hit the notification bell so you never miss a magical moment. Wishing you all a season filled with joy, wonder, and of course, plenty of enchanting reads. Happy holidays, and until next time, may your books be a source of endless magic.